Nonfiction is a great way to develop empathy. It's why we read aloud to small children about bears and dragons and fairies and princesses so that they can put themselves in the shoes of those characters that they hear about and begin to think outside of themselves mm -hmm. and about the feelings, interests, and lives of someone, something mm -hmm. other than themselves for the very first time. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where our interview guests today are Allie Frank and Asha Humans. A couple of years ago, I met these two women at AOA in Philadelphia. Now, I was just coming off a trip to the American Booksellers Association, where I've been away thinking books for like four or five days. And I was literally here for one night, one day. And I was in Philly and I said, I'm not picking up any more books. That's it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go see a couple of people on the floor and I'm going to go to a couple of panels. And I went to a panel and I don't remember who I'd gone to see, but these two lovely people were on the panel and started talking about their book. And they made me laugh so hard, just describing the plot that I walked up and said, I need to have a copy. And Allie gave me, I think the copy that her mother had been reading or something like that, because of the only copy they had left. And I literally went home and with the whole stash I brought home that week, the book I started reading was Tiny Imperfections. And I just sat and laughed. And I said, this book has got this smart, smart, dead on writing. And I picked it as a book reporter bets on, and it came out in the beginning of the COVID days, May, 2020, when we were all in our homes locked down. So getting to meet these people was not going to happen except on screens like this, maybe. And other than that, it was just me sitting there touting, this is a really good book, which I still continue to do. So then I got the copy of Never Meant to Meet You, and it came across my desk. And typically, there's a lot of pressure on a sophomore novel. Like, can they deliver again? Was that the humor just the first time? Was I still going to love these people? And it totally delivered. I actually sat in bed reading this laughing. I will confess that one night after reading it, I had a dream and I was laughing in my dream and woke myself up. And because here we have not just the action on the page, we've got this interior dialogue that's going on that really makes the books work. And it's like you walk into the room and you see the room, but what's going on in your head? So this one, too, is a book reporter bets on selection. And here's something else that happened. I described this book a couple of weeks ago, last week, at the Book Pacino Live event that we do, where we preview books coming out. And I talked about it. And at the end, we asked those who attend live to write down the book or uh, on a survey, the book they, they, what books they most want to read. And this was the one that they most wanted to read. This is at the top of the list. And I love that because it was not just that they were like just listening, but I think they really got that humor works and humor and making people laugh as they address serious situations is a really big deal. So with that intro, I welcome you both. It is so good to see you again. Oh. Good to see you too. And by book three, can it please be in person again? Please be in person again. We will definitely figure that out. We will figure okay, that out. Good. Yes. You, you were can, one of the first people that we met on our- The right. only person we met. I think, yeah. Well, in real. Tiny Imperfections yeah. into the pandemic. And we you brought us back to your- you came to my office. office. Yeah. You came to my office. The picture you have on the, your front page of your site, we took at my office. Yes. I'm sitting in my turquoise. And I look the other day and I go, those are my turquoise chairs that like I'm oh. sitting in the turquoise chair right now at my house. <laughs> we moved all that furniture to my house. You know, just imagine that. And, but you guys were there and you came in and everybody in the office, I remember, was excited about meeting you because you just exuded that enthusiasm for your book. And it was great. It really, really was. Well, we, we talked felt about the support it. from you right from the mm -hmm. beginning. And um, I just feel like you're an integral part of our journey. So thanks for oh, having that's so I'm so good. I'm so happy. I really am so happy to hear that. I should have interviewed you last year. Like, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? <laughs> you know, and it's, so let's start out about how you two know each other and how you came to be writing partners, because I think this is a really interesting story. Well, Allie and I met at a small private school in Seattle, Washington. Um, all four of our children attended and mm -hmm. I was the pre-K teacher and Allie was assistant head of school. And we both were on the admissions team together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we worked for um, 
a very brilliant educator, a Swiss German woman who was also very formal in how she ran her school. Mm -hmm. And when we would debrief at our admissions meetings, we would talk about the children, talk about the families, how they would best support our school, how we would best support them. And then Allie and I would scuttle off to my classroom kitchen and tee hee together and say, oh my goodness, did you see that one kid? <laughs> Serious nose picker. We're going to have to watch that kid. Or, um, wow. Um, Hot dad. Hot let's dad. Let's take the dad. Do you remember what kid is what? It belonged to him? No. Nope, nope. but Let's take that family. We want that family. Um, Very scientific way to do admissions, <laughs> according to us. So we found out we shared a real similar sense of humor when we would spout off and say, oh, if I ever write a book, that story's going in it. Or that kid's going in it. But that was a joke then, mm-hmm. right? Like if I ever write a book. Yeah. That was, yeah. Sort, and, sort of just random. And then dialogue. how did you decide that you were going to write the book? Because I want to hear more of, I want you to talk about tiny imperfections instead of me doing it. But it's, how did you just say, okay, we're going to write, if I write a book. <laughs> we're well, we're one of the poster women for ignorance is bliss. <laughs> because I've read Asha's narratives from, report cards. So I knew she was good at writing about kids in schools. Asha had read a boatload of emails from me as an administrator. Um, But then you left the school first to start a catering company. Then I left um, to co-found another private school here in the Seattle area. And I was actually on a bus in a snowstorm from my parents' house in Sun Valley, Idaho to Boise. And I'd just done this big tour looking at other private schools. And this whole idea of what would it be like if it was a person of color who held the keys to the kingdom, the education kingdom, that all the privileged white people want into, Mm -hmm. which is the reverse of everything that's out there. What would that story be? What would that look like? Who would be the other characters? And by the time... Um, I got to the Boise airport because there's no cell service between Sun Valley, Idaho and Boise. I was sort of levitating from this idea for the story. I mean, I didn't know if we could write it. And Ash and I had seen each other a couple of times a year since we both left the school, but it's not like we were, you know, Wednesdays having lunch together. And I called her up and she, this is pre-May 2020 (laughs) spring awakening when language was a little more um, top of mind. So do you want to say how I... So Allie calls <laughs> and my cell phone shows a Boise area code. I'm like, who do I know in Boise? I don't know one single person in Idaho. What's going on? And she calls and says, hey, Asha, do you want to have coffee and talk about race? <laughs> and I'm like, who the hell is this? <laughs> so eloquent, so eloquent. But with enthusiasm... I said, hey, let's do it. And we met at the local coffee shop and spent hours there talking about this idea she had, going off on tangents on how we could plump it up. And um, I just couldn't say no. Her enthusiasm was on 10. Mm-hmm. And she turned me up to 11. <laughs> um, and I said, well, let's try it. And so we did. And 14 yeah. months later, we sold our book uh, to Penguin Random House. Wow. Wow. That's an achievement. That's a real achievement because you, it's not like you went to writing school and now I took a 10 MFA classes. It was just a really great idea. And it was also an idea where you're talking about things culturally, but when you talk about them, it's not in your face being preached at. It's real life. It's this is the way it is. This is what ends up happening. And I think that that's the refreshing part about the book at a time where a lot of things I feel like I'm being preached to or being told what to do. And from the cover of the book to the description of the copy to the ardent conversation about the book, it's not just a story anymore. It's some kind of a preaching conversation. And am I making sense there? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, you know, I think it's really interesting being an educator in our culture because we're at this time professionally where right people are having multiple careers and they work at multiple different companies and organizations but we still as a culture think educators teachers can do one thing and they should stay at their school forever and Mm -hmm. it's this very narrow 
lens of the abilities and the skills and the talents of educators, yet educators, teachers, administrators, us, our work, life's work is observing people mm -hmm. from the littlest mm -hmm. to grandparents day. Mm -hmm. And so between Ash and I, we have over 40 years in schools. That's 40 years of intense observation of every different kind of humanity out there. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing that I get, think gets lost um, when people really understand what teachers know and are able to do. It's like, we are true like aficionados and experts on humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's something that then we can really make flawed but lovable deep but sometimes petty and shallow <laughs> characters exactly and school is something we all have in common mm -hmm. yes whether we're yes. homeschooled or we're in independent private schools or public schools college junior college we've all been to school mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. sort of way mm -hmm. um, it's something that people can relate to it's such a relatable atmosphere that placing our characters around mm -hmm. schools um i think speaks to our readers mm -hmm. Completely does. You know, um, my mom was a teacher. So I always saw it from the teacher point of view as well. It's like so and so struggling. I have to really help this child. And my mother was very instrumental in every child did well. I mean, it was one of these amazing things. And she she passed away this summer. And I heard a lot of stories about her from people that still are in touch with her. She gave, she had these little smiley face things in the classroom, and she gave all the classroom um, assets to one of her uh, former students who she felt could bring that to the classroom. And this woman wrote me this long note about what my mother had been there for her and what she'd done. And then somebody else said, you know, I didn't never thought my second grade teacher would come to my book launch. And when she retired in, eight, in 1984, and it was 2010 when this ended up happening. So she, like the connection. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that I really get it too, is because you remember the mother coming home talking about some of the kids in the class. For some kids, it made her crazy too. Let's get real, mm -hmm. but you know. It was, you know, it was before the days of there was ADHD or all these labels we put on children. It was just, they were kids in your class and it was a whole different world. But seeing that world from your perspective, you've seen the parents, you've seen how they handle different situations. I mean, I laugh because you get to the point where there are like, you know, well, in high school and everyone's going to go to Harvard. <laughs> and I remember one of well, them. Well, that starts in kindergarten. <laughs> one mother was really funny at baseball one day. She says, I just want to know, when do they all stop getting VG plus? She says, because at this rate, the whole class is going to Harvard. Where's going to be that breaking line of someone really doesn't know math? And it was true because at the beginning, everything's kind of even. And mm -hmm. then it starts to go like this. So... So when Tiny Perf Imperfection, it takes place at this private school with administrators. Just tell us a little bit more about it, because I just love this story. <laughs> well, it is really, uh, I mean, it's just a small slice of the stories that Allie and I have mm -hmm. from all of our years. Some we put in, some we modified, some we still have to leave out to protect the, the innocently guilty. <laughs> um, but again, kids make us laugh. We learn from them. Um, they're very, very honest in their approach to life before they've sort of been trained into not to ask impolite questions. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. trying to figure out their world. And it's something that we wish, Alan and I wish that adults would continue to do as well. Mm -hmm. Look, fiction is a great way to develop empathy. It's why we read aloud to small children about bears and dragons and fairies and princesses so that they can put themselves in the shoes of those characters that they hear about and begin to think outside of themselves mm -hmm. and about the feelings, interests, and lives of someone, something mm -hmm. other than themselves for the very first time. That happens around three, four, and five years old. And it can still happen for grownups. Mm -hmm. We want adults to put themselves in the shoes of our characters and think about what, what would it be like if I'm a black woman and now all of a sudden, all these white folks want to be my friend <laughs> because they imagine that getting into the school 
is going to secure the happiness of their child. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a story in itself. And then the realities of that is something entirely different. Mm -hmm. And I think also one of my favorite parts of Tiny Imperfections is it is a multi-generational story of three black women who all have had different experiences in this one school. So Aunt Viv, who's been the cook there for 50 years, Josie, our protagonist, who is, who is, an alumni of the school and now the director of admissions, and then Jesse's daughter that's graduating. And, you know, we often think like the only time that exists is the time that we live in right now. And so, you know, progress hasn't happened or it hasn't happened fast enough. Um, and then we have to keep relearning the same mistakes, but there is inc incremental progress and being able to show the incremental process of these three black women in a privileged world is it perfect is it 100 percent equal no but aunt viv's experience and how she sees herself within that society and versus how etta the daughter the third generation that's graduating sees herself as a black woman in the world of a privileged education is very different so being able to see a progression, again, not perfect, not done, but there was really important for us also. Mm -hmm. And the title, Tiny Imperfections, it's these, you think you're perfect, but they're little imperfections all along the way. And they're the ones we need to work on. Those are the things that we need to be doing and challenging ourselves to do. So after Tiny Imperfections, did you immediately know you wanted to write another book? You're like, oh yes, we're authors now. Or you were like, I don't know. Do I want to do this again? Well, I mean, it's oh, the, this is a big story. It's the funny part of me and Allie is, um, you know, we have a great balance with our attitudes. I mean, so similar in so many ways, but also very different. She is much more of a planner where I'm kind of like, eh, we'll get to it. Um, she's a, you know, she, she thinks, overthinks things and me. Yeah ring has a bit of a hand ringer and I'm like eh, it'll be fine and I think she helps to spur me on and I help to bring her back to earth mm -hmm. and so one of the things she was always were we a, you know was were we a one-hit wonder is that it for us I don't know can we do it again and I'm like ah, probably but one thing we didn't know was that we had a great time writing together mm -hmm. and though we've both written separately um, for ourselves and also um, to put things out into the world, it just felt right to keep going as a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've worked in schools for so long with families and kids. I just couldn't imagine working alone. Mm -hmm. I'm too much of a chatter. I need <laughs> somebody to bounce my ideas yeah. off of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. Yeah. Well, it was, but now can I share the challenging part of it. it so that was the reality like we wanted to do another book because we had fun like who doesn't want to be able to make their work life also a fun life but it was really interesting because as you mentioned tiny imperfections came out in may of 2020 and then the george floyd um incident happened and spring awakening and really amazing conversations out in the country and organizations and companies looking very closely at their hiring practices what they're representing um, the stories that are being told out in the world so asha and i thought like oh my god we're totally teed up mm -hmm. i mean what is more um on point than two women who are writing about challenging topics together, not just one lens, but a lens of humanity. And we were at a great publishing house. We just put out Tiny Imperfections. Yes, it was not great timing, but the book was getting great reviews. Mm -hmm. It had decent sales. And our publishing house had even literally had just put out um, after the blackout day, they had put out their um, statement to the world about how they were going to have greater diversity hiring, put greater um, stories of diverse storytelling out in the world. 
And we had submitted our proposal in the first four or five chapters of Never Meant to Meet You to our editor and our team at our publishing house. And we thought like, we're golden. Mm -hmm. And they let us go. Wow. Wow. Literally after they just put that statement out to the world. And we understood, you know, some of that was that companies were cutting the fat and, um, uh, hey, I got a, I got a little extra on my backside. So I understood we were the little low man on the totem pole. They had right. to support some other authors, but we just felt like there was a missed opportunity that mm-hmm. we didn't want to be guilty of missing. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, and I, and it's interesting because you your messaging was not hitting over the head. It was just great storytelling right from the first book. And it continues into the second book. It absolutely, you know, it, it continued. And I can see message here, what's happening. So you now- well, and I think at the time, given all that was happening in the country, I, I think to be fair, the publishing houses probably felt like we got to put stuff out into the world that is hitting people over the head. We have to have, you know, that feeling that happens very much in our culture of like, We have to have change and we have to have it right now. Mm -hmm. And we can't soft step it, Mm -hmm. which we all know though, as humans, no one changes by having something forced down their throat. But that was sort of the direction and that's how our culture works. So, you know, we got sidestepped for more, you know, over the head Mm -hmm. type Mm -hmm. writing, but, you know, all things happen for a reason and we, So we went forward writing this book without knowing where it would land. And we ended up with such an incredible team at Montlake and it, you know, we ended up where we should be, Mm -hmm. but it was, there was a time of devastation and we were Mm -hmm. in the pandemic, tiny imperfections didn't get the due. We thought it should, we were cut off from, cause we loved our editor Um, But we were cut off from that team and it felt like starting over again um, when all we were doing was staring at each other Mm -hmm. during COVID. Yeah. (laughs) Going, oh, you again? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're starting over again. Also, you had a team behind you before that was like saying, oh, this is great. Here's your cover. Here's this. Here's that. And then I mean, May 2020 was just a very weird time. It was just... I remember going over, um, we went over for my mom to see my mom for her birthday and she was like really down. And I said, you know what? We're having Mother's Day next week. Like, that's it. Like, we're doing this. Like, you're coming to the house. Like, we're just going to do this because I can't go through life at this point waiting for things to happen. And it was a really rough time. And it was, people didn't know what were happening in publishing. Meanwhile, I called the CEO of one of the companies and I said, if this isn't your golden age, I don't know what is because they're going to run out of things to put on TV. They're not going to go to the movies. They're not going to be sports. If you can't figure it out now, like forget it. And 2021 it ended up to be a really good year for publishing because mm-hmm. everything was completely set up. But at the same time is people were making decisions at home and people were making decisions in publishing that sometimes you give a look across a room and you can get people to unite on what you're doing or what you're saying. And everybody was just fractured in all different places. And I see it still as an issue. It's still a problem because I think that there are things that right now, if we're going to have everybody working remotely or doing this, you got to change your teams up. You've got to change. There's, there's just a lot of change that needs to happen. Like you can't manage more than four people remotely. I mean, you honestly truly really can't. I've been doing this for a really long time. I and- can really manage me remotely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason you have to be together. You know what I mean? But you know what I'm talking about? It's like a lot of things were changing, but everybody wasn't right sure, like, you know, how to do it. So, okay. So you've got this book. So how do you describe never meant to meet you because mine is just, I sat and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is really loosely based on us. I mean, we, again, we wrote this book through the pandemic without it being sold to anybody. So mm-hmm. we, it ended up being a piece for ourselves. Really. We had to get through um, some disappointments mm-hmm. in those, those years of being isolated um, both of my children, their graduations from college and high school, prom, Allie's daughters in the formative years of, of um, elementary school, and with Tiny Imperfections, we had a whole coast to coast tour planned before the whole world came wow. to, an, to a stop. And we sort of felt like, wow, we worked so hard 
and our recognition kind of went out the window. Wah, 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 wah. So it, there was some grief there. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really think about it as a grief filled time for me. I sort of thought about death as the, an expression of, you know, when, you, when you're grieving. But through writing this book, I realized I needed to get over a few things myself, mm -hmm. plenty of disappointments. Mm -hmm. And I needed to grieve those things. But again, with Allie next to me, how can you examine anything without laughing at it? So we <laughs> needed to find a way to get through our feelings, to get over our feelings and still keep a smile on our faces. Mm -hmm. So we wrote this about mm -hmm. two friends that are one black Baptist woman and one white Jewish woman who are neighbors and have so far kept their distance, but they're brought together over a tragedy on their, in their neighborhood. And they discover that the distance that they kept because of their differences just shrank. Mm -hmm. Both the distance and the differences shrank when they got to know each other. Mm -hmm. And they end up healing together from their very, their, each of their sources of grief and finding each other and building sort of a new family with their respective families. Mm -hmm. And that is something that Ali and I did through the pandemic. We had to commit if we were going to work together to isolate our own families into a pandemic bubble. Couldn't mm -hmm. really hang out with other friends because then who knows what I would be bringing to her and her family. So we committed to keep working on this together. And that was a source of support to get us both through. Mm -hmm. It was a tough mm -hmm. time for two very social people. <laughs> very well, social that, animals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I would add, it's funny because we, you just did a really good job describing it, by the way. <laughs> but, it, you know, when we, when we do talk about it, and I usually make Asha do it, um, it the, the layer that is on top of that, that's hard to figure out how to weave in when telling what the book is about is that it's about these two neighbors. They're different. They haven't really given each other the time of day. It's about grief and healing. And it's really freaking funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people are like, you know, so does that mean you're inappropriate? Does that mean, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be super offended? And you know, the answer is, well, maybe because, um, I mean, there are a few offended reviews that we've gotten, but overall we're not making fun of mm -hmm. anyone or any one culture, but we're reminding people that laughter and joy is so important and you can laugh and you can have joy with people different than you. Mm -hmm. We're so much at this place in our culture where we're so fearful of saying the wrong thing or offending someone else that we're going further apart, not together. We're sort of set up that like, you have to use the, the right language. You have to say the right thing. You have to write the out, ask the right questions to bring everyone together and have this mutual, um, you know, understanding and respect for one another. But what we see is happening is more people are so fearful of stepping on someone's toes that like, well, then I'll just stay to my, to my corner. Mm -hmm. and then we're not growing. We're not learning. We're not laughing together. We're not sharing tears together. So we wanted to figure out like, can a grief be funny? And I well, think it, it is. really is because it starts with um, the woman next door is um, holding Shiva at her house. Now I have funny Shiva story. I was going to Shiva for one of my friends. I had never been to Shiva. So I go in and I look up everything about it and the mirrors are going to be covered and she's going to be sitting on a low chair and their clothes are going to be ripped and all this stuff. And I get over to my friend's house and it's like a party, right? And I walked to the side and I said, but wait a second, like what's going on here? And she turns around and she goes, oh, we're just, we're reformed. We don't do all those things. But meanwhile, I had my whole, in my brain, this is what it's going to be like. The mirror is going to be covered. They're not going to be wearing makeup. They're not. And I had the whole list because I had done my studying in advance of what's mm -hmm. going over. So I am sitting there pic picturing Marjette going over to this house next door with her fried chicken, which really just made me laugh because I've never, I've been a lot of shit, I've never seen fried chicken on a table. Lots of cold cup platters, lots of sweets and desserts, never fr fried chicken. 
And I just started laughing because I just was remembering me waiting for everyone to be sitting on the little low chairs and my whole perception of what's going on. And when she walks in and she tries to yank the blanket or off the mirror, it's just this perfect moment of not understanding what's going on culturally. And mm -hmm. it's, it's always, oh, we don't understand black culture. And meanwhile, this woman's walking in this house and she's going, I have no idea what these Jewish people are doing mm -hmm. and why they're behaving like this. And we're the children, you know? <laughs> My, right. It's like, it's a whole, it's a, you flip the story, you flipped it the other way. And in flipping mm -hmm. it, you really get to understand both people better. Is that heading in the right direction? You know? Absolutely. And I would add that a, a big, without hitting anyone over the head, um, theme that we wanted to mirror in our book is that the Jewish culture and the black culture in our country have a long-standing connection of similar persecution, similar experiences as a minority within a majority culture. Yet, because Jewish people are white, there is this assumption that because you're white, you're the majority, we know what your world is like. We understand what your world is like. But that, you know, there's only 16 million Jews in the entire world. It's a very small population. And the culture and the tradition aren't well known. So that was something that we really wanted to follow through the similarities in our, um, in our country, but also that here's a black woman who feels like, you know, is always the one teaching, who's learning a lot about a facet of the white culture. Um, so that was, so, that was really intentional as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, can, sorry, can we have a small tangent? Can I just tell you a really funny story about yeah. Asha? Yes. <laughs> I'm not so, so you're like starting to sweat. So right before COVID hit, we were actually in Sun Valley together. Do you know what I'm going to say? No. Okay. I we were in wait. Sun Valley together. Um, so there's this organization called the National Brotherhood of Skiers, which is thousands and thousands of mm -hmm. black skiers. Yes. And they go to a different ski resort yes. each year. It actually started their first resort with Sun Valley and they come back the most often. So they do have church on Sunday at the Sun Valley Opera House. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm super fired up to go. Can't wait. They're going to have the gospel music, the whole thing. But I'm also really aware, like I'm probably going to be the only white person there. I haven't been to a lot of, um, she was. yeah, <laughs> a lot of, you know, Baptist, whatever, church. So I was very aware of being, um, you know, complimentary, listening, not acting out, not laughing, any of that. But so then it's the end, it's getting towards the end. And so they're inviting people up to give testimonials. And I, you know, I'm listening so intently. Oh, you know, look at that person up there speaking their tr truth. And Asha just leans over and she's like, I'm going to go sell some books. <laughs> It's like, no, you can't do that. She's like, oh, yes, I am. And Asha went up on the stage and gave testimonial about tiny imperfections and selling books as if God were literally going to like reach his hand down or her hand down and hand Asha 20 and pick up a book. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, we can't do that in church. It'll totally offend everyone. I'm the only white person here. They're going to think it's my, that, that I came up with this. Don't go do it. And she's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go sell books. <laughs> I can picture this now. I, I was can picture this now. I was sitting like that. She was just like that. Yeah. Hair over her face. Like you can't. Yeah. I don't know her. I don't know her. I don't and know. Truly, really, it was very, um, I mean, an ordinary thing, you mm -hmm. know, I fully expected plenty of other people to say, I've got this business and I hope you all bless me with, you know, following me here and there. And um, so a moment for Allie to, to be in the center and learning as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dying. I was more in the center and dying. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really what happens. This is really what happens at church. You know, this is really what's going on. And it is because you don't understand each other's cultures. And I remember when the group of skiers came out, we were at some resort, I can't remember where. And they were like, oh, this is just going to be, this is, they travel all different resorts. And it's, what is it? The Brotherhood of Skiing? Is that what's National called? National Brotherhood of Skiers. Yeah. NBS. It was great. It was great. Yeah. And it was, it was really fun. 
it was uh, it was only bested by um the time that we were in crested butte and there were a group of disabled veterans there mm. and my son only knew how to go straight down the hill and my husband goes we've got people that have survived vietnam world war ii and they're not going to survive the three-year-old going straight down the <laughs> hill and it's like we're going to bring him right back to the lodge <laughs> you know so it was New definition of bomber. New definition of this is what's going to end up happening. This is what's going to end up happening. So, you know, I do love the mom the day before kindergarten starts because it is this kindergarten teacher. She's already, she has her rules of the way she opens kindergarten and she's got all her folders and everything's all ready to go. And she has this mother who writes with distinct, distinct ideas on how her child should be experiencing this year in school because her son's kindergarten was such a disappointment with the other teacher and she just knows that she can set this up now and I'm laughing because I'm just picturing this happening and I bet you say it was true it these things happened oh most definitely you know <laughs> I having the pleasure of <laughs> of uh welcoming the the newest students to the campus where Allie and I worked um, I was also welcoming the newest parents mm -hmm. and they're letting their first baby often into the world in the hands of a complete stranger for six plus hours a day. Um, and I know how hard that is. I had to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way they would try to control that and feel better about that situation was mm -hmm let me make sure the teacher knows my child best. <laughs> you know, I always say parents, they will always know their children best as a person, but I knew them best as a student. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. something entirely mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. It took some time for most of them to really get that, often the last week of the school year, which was okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was the joy and the pain of the job. It all came with it. But growth is what we wanted to see no matter when it mm -hmm. happened with both the children and, and their the parents. parents. And their parents. And Marcia sees the best in the kids. And she has to quickly assess the parents. Like, okay, wait, is this one going to be a problem? Is this one dropping off too quickly? Is this one dropping off too long, hanging out, blah, blah, blah. You may readers are aware that teachers, it, it's not just about the child. And that very much comes across in the story, but it's the whole family. And I feel like that's something that's needed a lot in education today. And when we talk about education and we're, let's say the inner city, we're, we're not getting that because you're not seeing the whole family. You may see a fractured family. You may see somebody who's just rushing in to drop off their child because they're running to another job quickly. And it's not that they're not involved, but I think that what you're really talking about is the whole family needs to be part of it. And why, when we're talking about school, are we only talking about the kids? Like, why are we only, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of parents were watching the teachers teach on screen and evaluating what the teachers are doing and writing them notes and saying, I don't think you really did a good job of that. I mean, think about how tough it was to teach well, on screen where the teacher, you, you could be watched all day long, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a difference we recognize between this privileged world of independent schools mm -hmm. that and inner city schools that are often um, populated by twice as many students in the classroom as we ever had. Mm -hmm. um, that having taught in a class with two I had a teacher, assistant teacher often, and another full teacher mm -hmm. with me for 16 students. That is unheard of. Mm -hmm. It also costs a lot of money to sustain something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, somewhere in the middle, there has to be uh, a better solution for everyone so that kids and their families get the type of individual attention that teachers really desire to give them. Mm -hmm. It is the goal of teachers to support the full family into creating an interested and successful student. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would also say we need to change the narrative on what it means to be an involved parent, mm -hmm. because the image that is out there is more often than not the mom that can be the class, you know, the class president or the classroom, you know, person yeah. be there for all the parties who you know can help chaperone and whether it's in private schools or in suburban public or um, urban public you can be an involved parent and you can be invited in in very small ways that 
teachers just need to be creative about. We live in a culture where educators only re call home if something's gone wrong. When I was teaching and when I was administrator, I had the rule for myself once a day, I was going to make a good call mm -hmm. where I would call a parent and just tell them the good thing that happened with their child today. And even just that small bit would make the parent who, you know, was working 90s hours a week, couldn't be there for whatever reason, feel good and more of a part of things because they were seeing that their child was a part of things because I was giving positive feedback. So I think part of it, what regardless of what school you're in, it's also rethinking parent involvement and what that looks like and what that relationship looks like. And especially with now so many people working from home, what can you do as a father that you might not have been able to do before that you can run over at lunchtime and do the lunch, you know, whatever, whatever is involved with what's going on. And I think that that's something that's changed along the way. There are a lot of women that are working at home now that can actually run out and get more involved in their child's day, whether it's seeing off to school or picking up in the afternoon. It's just been, roles have changed so drastically over the last two years. And I don't think we're really still looking at what that means. I don't think we still have a handle on it. Um, we have a teacher shortage in New Jersey, a huge teacher shortage of people that just walked away from the profession over the last couple of years, because let's face it, it was really hard. It was a job that, you know, you were working from home, but you were doing your children usually and whatever was going on in the classroom. And it was, um, it's often for not that much pay. And mm -hmm. that's what's something that's a real issue as well. So you need people like the Margette kind of teacher who I loved. She was teaching the girls how to be part of each other's lives. And this, this one was really big to me. So a little girl has an accident in the classroom <laughs> and she tells her friend how to take care of this and what she's going to do. And by watching that, it was a simple lesson, but it was saying so much of you're going to have this girl's back and you're not going to make fun of her for doing this, but let me explain how you're going to do it. And you're going to go in the bathroom and this is what's going to be there. And it's going to help her. And you're going to guard the door. And I just love that because it was a simple lesson, but it was a really good experience lesson for that girl of if it was handled right by her as well of what was going to happen. And mm -hmm. it was this little piece in the book, but you saw so much from that little scenario. It's so funny because that, that what you're talking about reminds me a lot of Allie and a lesson that she teaches her daughters. I have two boys. Allie has two girls. And one of my favorite le life lessons that she tries to impart on them, I don't think I've told you this, mm -hmm. but it's so um, indic indicated by that scene that she tells her girls, you know, it is easy to show up for your friends and in the good moments of your friendship, but make sure you show up at the hard times. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a measure of, of a true friend. Mm -hmm. um, and and she, we sort of pared it down into that scene for two little bitty girls. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where it begins. When you start to teach your young girls the lessons that are going to take them into being young women mm -hmm. um, and how to look out for each other. Mm -hmm. It was just a really poignant of like, this is what you're going to do. And it was also the way she was doing it was like kind of, kind of conspiratorial. It's like, it's like, this is what we're going to do. You're going to go do this. And people love when they're going to get involved and they feel like they're part of the game. It's like, you know, oh, this is like totally great. Oh, especially kids. They start whispering, just yeah. like whispering. I'm going to go help you. This is yeah. what she told us to do. I could just picture the conversation. This is what she told us to do. Now we're going to go and blah, 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 blah. You know, grief is a big underlying theme in the book, but it's not heavy. It's about working your way through it and those who can help you steer. And there are people that can help you along the way when you're in this kind of a situation and do you let them there or how do you handle it? And was there any inspiration for like that whole part of the book of, we're going to be together that way, but it's going, we're going through grief. It's not going through moments of great joy. It's going through, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing that could happen. Well, I, it really came from during the pandemic, like Asha said, there was, as a culture, we're a pretty fearful culture of the topic of grief. Mm -hmm. And we really attribute it to, you can be a person who's grieving if someone has died. 
But other than that, does grief really apply? And then we are in the pandemic where everyone had lost something. Mm -hmm. Some people lost people and that is tragic and devastating. Some people lost jobs, tragic and devastating, lost routine, lost, you know, a, a positive state of mental health. And in all that grief, to me, what really sort of bubbled to the top was there is not one right way to grieve and move on. And particularly in religions, there are rituals and they're there and they're there for a reason and that's wonderful, but doesn't mean that everyone will move through in the exact same way. Some people need more time. Some people need outside support. Some people need friendship. So we really wanted to explore this idea that there are multiple ways to grieve and heal. And sometimes we have friends or neighbors or who all with the best in, of intentions want to help you move your grief along. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, people have to own for themselves what's going to work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, Noah had one way that it ultimately worked for her. And for, you know, Margette, it was time. It was really time, even though her friend Judy was trying to push her along. So that was really the exploration around grief was that individuality of getting support from the outside world, but then also recognizing this is what I know I need to do because I know myself best. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that where Margette was coming in the whole story as well as she was anticipating what was going to happen. She was anticipating it's going to be bad when my son leaves. It, it's that moment of prolonged grief because you're getting ready for it all along the way. And yet she says, I have to stay single. Like I can't like date at this point. I can't have somebody else coming into his life. And like she had herself in this little bubble at the same time of what was going on. But she's also experiencing like, you know, what her son is going to possibly be doing. And my, my favorite was these little lines of, I know she's upstairs with a girlfriend and she's making a baby daddy. Like, I know that's happening like right now. And it was these he, hysterical conversations because she's at the neighbor's house. She's looking at the window. She's, I know what's going on upstairs. And yeah. she would walk home and he'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm making a peanut butter sandwich. Like, what, what are you talking yeah. about? But the way our minds work of what's going to go on, you know, mm -hmm. those are Anticipation those. Anticipation is always, always so much worse than reality. Yes, it is. It totally is. You know, it's, um, there's so many, a lot of themes of race and culture that are forefront of conversations. But what I love about your books is they convey these messages with storytelling and humor and the messaging's there, trust me, the messaging's there. And, but by the same token, you're laughing so hard that you're actually feeling like, you know, this person mm -hmm. and you understand like how she's feeling and what's going to happen. Like you just feel like you're a part of what her life is. And I just love that part of it because I felt like I understood her and I wanted to be a bigger part of her life. I wanted to have her over for dinner. I wanted her to cook for me. That was really where I was headed. I like to cook, but it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's see what's going on here. And was there a lot that were, when you were working on this, were you saying we're messaging too hard or we're just getting the humor right or we got to pull it back or what was going on? That's a good question. Those things do cross our minds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the intense benefits of having two of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there'll be some times when Allie goes, oh my gosh, look what I wrote. Isn't this funny? And I'll be like, eh, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's pretty good. You know, or um, I'll want to go off in this direction. And I'll like, bring it back, bring it back. We got a story to tell. You got too many tangents going on, Asha. Um, so we do, we're able to balance each other that way and to check in and say, hey, mm -hmm. how, how are we doing with this? What's our timing like? Um, and then again, working with an amazing editing team. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Although I'm cutting in on you for a second. Like the crazy thing is with both our books, with tiny imperfections and with never meant to meet you. Cause we were like the only writers we knew we didn't have a critique group. Yeah. We didn't have readers, you know, and we're writing humor about hard topics. No one read our books before they went out to a publishing house and an editor. 
So there was definitely like, we think it's funny. We think it's good. All this stuff that, you know, there are a lot of authors who have, you know, in their acknowledgement section, sometimes I read a lot and I'm like, God, they have all those friends willing to read draft after draft after draft. (laughs) I mean, even our husbands are like, we'll see it at the end. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, so that part was really kind of crazy. Like we both liked it. And then it went out to be sold. So, um, but again, I feel like I'm going to, can I, I'm tooting our horn for a minute. I feel like we have really um, sort of common sense, moral compasses Mm -hmm. that we can recognize because again, it happens because we've spent so much time in humanity. Mm -hmm. We know when the pendulums are swinging too wide, one direction or the Mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I feel really confident in our judgment. And then now we have such an incredible acquisitions editor and development editor that we trust to the moon and back Mm -hmm. that um, we feel pretty good. I can, I do want to say one thing that was super interesting though with never meant to meet you is, you know, now a lot of books go out to cultural readers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sensitivity readers. Yes. So ours went out to a black woman to read and um, we got her, all her comments back. And, you know, as writers, you get to choose, you don't have to react to everything. So we picked which stuff we agreed and which things we wanted to leave, but it was, I think a big learning moment for our editor, because I also knew that our book had to go out to a rabbi. Mm -hmm. It had to go out to someone who was a more conservative um, Jewish practitioner than I am. And there are many things that we did not get right. And I said to our editor um, that, you know, some sensitivity reading is completely opinion. Mm -hmm. Some sensitivity reading is really from knowledge. And this person who read our book and gave us wonderful feedback and put her whole heart into it. Mm -hmm. There was not one comment related to Judaism. Mm -hmm. It was all related to Margette's story and the, and the black story. And the whole other half of the book was about a Jewish character in the Jewish world. And so this, this whole concept of sensitivity reading is an interesting one because sometimes it's opinion and sometimes it really does need to be based in knowledge and fact. And, you know, thank goodness I had the assets to send it out to my rabbi who I adore and close friends. Um, But had we not, we would have made some, there were some true errors in there. And so Mm -hmm. that was really interesting moment in our editing process for sure that I also think was a learning moment for our whole editing team Mm -hmm. you know at one point Margette is exclaiming that Max is super Jewish I love this and her friend Judy says is that like blackity black and it spoke to me just of what we're saying just before this dead on about how we see people and also made me think about as a reader think about those stereotype words that we use Oh, they're super Mm -hmm. Jewish. Oh, they're really blackly black. You know, and what you're doing there for the reader to me is you're just putting it out there. It's like, okay, this is what people actually do say. And let's not cover this up because it is the way people have conversations and it's the way they, you know, sit there and say what's going on. And I think that the honesty of language is something that also, if you're going to write about two different cultures, you might as well come dead on about this is why the cultures actually speak about each other at times. And each culture inherently, I have an Italian background. And when we get together with other people who are Italian, there are phrases and words and everything that are exchanged that you would not say to a larger group of people or they would be completely lost. And if you bring somebody into the family who's not Italian and they spend a couple of hours with you, they're like doing like a tennis match, trying to figure out what everybody's talking about. And it's a different, another different cultural reference. My, um, one of my uh, yoga teachers is Indian and she put up this beautiful dance that people were doing, obviously for some celebration the other day on Facebook. And she said, it's so, I loved being part of this. I'm so far from home 
which is not her home in Basking Ridge. It's her home in India. And I wanted to feel a part of what was going on. And when I read that, I was thinking about this book as well, is everybody's got their own culture. Everybody's got their own thing that they want to feel good about, but they also want to share and be able to share with other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what we need to do is like what my son did was go to the other religion. And I also, I always felt that at 13, kids in Catholic school make confirmation. Kids who are Jewish, bar mitzvah. And what I always felt was the age of 14, they should go to each other's churches or places of worship and get to know them. And I felt that that would be a great experience for kids to at least get to know what the other people are, what the other religions are like and their cultures. Before we just sit there and say, they're going to temple, what happens at temple? What happens at church? What happens at these things? So that you're not going into the rest of your life having to go to a funeral or a wedding or something and not understanding what those places are like. And it's once again, coming from that place of understanding, which I think you do a really good job of portraying of this is what's going to go on. So it's super Jew and blackity black. I loved it. It's <laughs> 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 told on, told on. And it's also those little comments about Darius. I mean, what he is doing, that inner monologue is just great for every mom of what they're thinking about their kid. So how much fun did you have writing that mother of boys? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's funny because, you know, we, we describe our writing as sort of this leapfrogging, you know, we pass sections back and forth to each other. Um, and Allie is this great story weaver. And I happen to be, you know, I think in my other life, I was an actress because I just love being in the mind and the voice and the soul of the characters and try to imagine what their backgrounds are. And uh, Ali once sent me a, a bit of dialogue between Margette and Darius. And it was a long conversation where Darius talks in paragraphs. And talks. <laughs> in paragraphs. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, boy, I live with my sons and I haven't even seen them in a week. <laughs> so to have that much conversation, that many words wouldn't happen in a month between us as much as I love them we, I've never heard them speak like that so you know we had to kind of come to a balance with that too it's not just about the race and religion but she had to get to know the cultural boys yes, um, yes. my house is it's me and three men in her house it's her poor husband and three women and a girl dog <laughs> and a girl dog my dog's also a and boy. only nieces Yes, the same. So our households sound different. Mm -hmm. um, our conversations flow differently as much as there is an overabundance of love in her home and in mine and a closeness of our families. They're just different because mm -hmm. they are. There is a culture of boys that is on the most part different than the culture of girls. Mm -hmm. So we had that um, type of writing to learn from each other as well. Right. That was fun though. Yeah, so, and I have to say my, and I don't wanna you know, spoil anything, but there is one line that Darius says when he has Esty on his hip and he's holding his girlfriend's hand that I still read and get and I wrote this line and I still read it and get teary because I feel like it, and it's towards the end of the book, but it was for me the moment where I feel like I got from Asha, from all our editing, from developing Darius, what a high school boy's evolution is. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. For all the lines in the book, that's the most personal to me because I'm like, okay, I got it. You got it. He grew, the family grew, whatever. Yeah. At one point, Margette is lacing into Darius and she shares with readers that she's dropping her G's and using her ain'ts, which means she's telling Darius this is not the average kind of trouble that he's in. <laughs> so let's talk about language and how it's sometimes what we use culturally and why it's that, you know, because every once in a while, you will hear somebody who can speak perfect English all the time, just drop into what I call kind of like dialect, <laughs> just like this is how it's really going to go down. And that's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I I went to a, a very elite private school here in Seattle. And there was a point in my day, those miles that I had to be bused away from home, when I was coming back, where I knew it was time to fall back into my home dialect. Mm -hmm. 
And I think some kids sort of think of it as, am I faking? Am I hiding who I actually am? But that is an asset that will serve those kids for their entire lives. You mm -hmm. will be able to flip the script, as we say, mm -hmm. change your entire intonation, even the subject matter, the way you greet mm -hmm. elders, mm -hmm. your body language will also follow. It's a survival tool. It's a way to connect. In the black community, it's also a way to say, I ain't no better than you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I talk to you the way your mama talked to you, mm -hmm. I might've gone to the greatest university and have this high echelon job, but in the end, I know where you're, you're coming from and I understand that you know where I'm coming from. My husband is white mm -hmm. and it took seven or eight years before he came up to really spend time with my family because he wasn't used to the language mm -hmm. and it wasn't the words and the loudness too, it right? was the intensity he thought we were always fighting <laughs> and i'm like no one's fighting here this is how we talk we tease each other we call each other out somebody's got a big forehead point it out to him <laughs> his family was very conservative family very quiet family extremely loving i love them i mean i feel like a huge part of their family um, but there's a different pattern of speaking in the home. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to appreciate that. My kids definitely know when they're in trouble. <laughs> As my voice changes and they begin to sweat. <laughs> this is what's happening now with her. That's Get right. on the page. It's you know? a tool that we use. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I would say all cultures, but parenting in all cultures, there are things you take advantage of. I mean, there are definitely um, parts of being Jewish and what Jewish people have gone through that I learn use for parenting moments all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, you, and it's completely not true. But right now, my daughters think that Jews don't get tattoos because of what happened in the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's useful. Yeah. Keep that going. It's, I'm like, I, I don't want to have a tattoo conversation. <laughs> so this is how I'm going to put it in a box, right? It I works. It. They don't think they get tattoos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you use what's in your toolbox as a parent. Right. And there's that scene also where um, Judy's coming over for dinner to meet Noah and Noah's got her spoon in the gumbo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's like, wait a minute, you never let me put my spoon in your gumbo when you're cooking because that is a rule. You better not put your spoon in my pot before this food hits the table. Right. But... Margette understands that if Noah doesn't know, she doesn't know. She gives her the grace of space to learn, mm -hmm. which I think is so mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. We're talking about language. I know if someone's approaching me with a question that they intend to be offensive, it could be a similar question that another person comes to me with the intention of love and learning. Mm -hmm. I know the difference. Mm -hmm. And Margette can sense the difference in Noah. She's not picking at her food to be rude. Mm -hmm. She just doesn't know yet. And Margette mm -hmm. offers her the grace of space. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon she'll know, mm -hmm. don't put that spoon in my pot. <laughs> <laughs> but not today. But today's not, not the day to have that. Today's that, that, not the day. It. You're going to get to it. Yeah. <laughs> there was a woman in the supermarket the other day that was holding her phone like this and pushing her cart and shopping. And obviously her daughter was pregnant and she was giving like life lessons as we went up and down the aisles. I mean, it was really, you have got to understand you're at a new place in your life. You're having this baby. And I was just, it was like up and down the aisles and this very attracted African-American woman, just absolutely gorgeous woman is holding his phone, lecturing up and down every aisle of the supermarket. And my husband is completely like not understanding this is what's going on. And I'm walking a little bit slower because I want to hear what she's saying. Yeah. And she was breaking into, you're right. She was breaking into dialect. She was doing every single thing. But if she turned to the guy at the supermarket, may I please have some ham? Um, mm -hmm. Can I please have this? Completely going to change and then keep right on going after her daughter. And I saw it and I was thinking about the moment in the book and it's like yes you change the way you speak you change what you do and it's you know according to your audience we often attribute that to culture but imagine 
you wouldn't talk to your boss the same way you talk to your girlfriends. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You wouldn't speak to your mm -hmm. priest the same way you speak to uh, a guy you're trying to hit on. Mm -hmm. We all amend the way we speak mm -hmm. in deference to the person we're speaking to, in reverence for them, in recognition of who they are, which is why being colorblind is not helpful. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. helpful to know where the person is from, who they are that you're speaking to, so that you can honor them with your language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hope people think about it that way instead of, oh, she's faking, she doesn't sound like that at home, mm -hmm. or she's putting on airs, or mm -hmm. they're talking like they're from the hood and they were really born in the suburbs. It's about respecting the person that you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. You know, when my mom was married, she was in the middle 50s. She was um, teaching in a store in e a school in East Orange and her favorite teacher, co-teacher was this um, Gertrude Rakes. And I remember the story my mother told many, many times. And she said to Gertrude, I'd like you to be in my wedding. And Gertrude said, Sylvia, I can't do that. She says, I'm black and you're an Italian family and this is not going to go well for you. I will come to dinner afterwards. And I remember my mom telling me that story and thinking about how this woman she was so close to she couldn't, the, the woman said, I, you will not feel comfortable that day. You will not, not, I will not, you will not feel comfortable that day. That story stayed with me like all these years from when I heard it. And my mother said, yeah, we had her over for a lovely dinner when we came back from our honeymoon. But I think about how hard that must've been for her to hear that because that's not what she was thinking. She's thinking she'd be standing beside her. And the rules were, that's the fifties that cut and dried of what she says, you cannot do this. So but on a lighter note, we have the Weight Watchers app and the Fitbit to lay some humor into this book. Like at any point, is Marjack going to do steps or eat peanut butter? What yeah. is her goal going to be? What is she going to be? And Judy, who was the other black teacher at the school who has left her alone in this island of white people, is coming over every day. She's now full loose and fancy free taking dancing classes and she's getting all her steps in. But that lays another layer of humor of the book because you've got this girlfriend that you're sitting telling stories to. <laughs> so how much fun was she to create? <laughs> oh, oh my was, God. We, she was fun. We love Judy. I mean, like, man, oh, it, it's those always, scenes were really fun. <laughs> I'm really stepping fun. outside yeah. your house waiting for you. Correct <laughs> line. <laughs> and you know, there's a real pressure when you're writing about um, diet culture mm. or um, body size, body positivity these days, because you don't, we didn't want this message to be that boy, these women are unhappy with their weight and they are working out constantly to fit in some sort of a box. There are Weight Watchers to chill out and talk about folks with each other. <laughs> you know, it sounds good. I'm going to Weight Watchers. And then they go to the coffee shop every day afterwards. That's kind of like me and Allie. Sure, we want to be healthy, but you know what? Macaroni and cheese is yummy. <laughs> so there's this, they use it as a way of being social. We yes. thought that was funny. Absolutely. And it's, you know, again, the extremism of our culture, we see either really thin women or very overweight women. Most women are in the middle and we try some days and we don't try others. And sometimes we throw some money at it. And most of the times that money is wasted. <laughs> yes, like $44 that's, a month. Yeah, I mean, that's really the most common experience. You know, I was good for two days, so I'm going to have ice cream now. Like, <laughs> you know, everyone's more in here, not, you know, these extremes and it was really interesting because one of the um biggest scenes that we got some feedback on is when Marjet, you know put on a new pair of jeans and they fit and she was surprised and we got feedback well you don't want to shame people who you know blah 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 but the reality is is whether you are a quite large woman or you're a quite small woman or you're in the middle it doesn't matter if you get to put on a smaller size, whatever that size is, you're feeling yourself. I'm buying it. Yeah. <laughs> That's you it. know, it's not about being skinny. It's just like, oh, I thought I was here, but I'm really here. So let's go. And that is a universal feeling, regardless of size. 
it's just a mental thing where you're feeling yourself. And so it's more, those are more the things we go after is those universal feelings, regardless of who you are, that all women Mm -hmm. feel, whether you're black, white, old, young, thin, large, like whatevs, there is a sort of elasticity in the middle that we all fall into. And this weekend, I am going to go through my closet and I'm going to say goodbye to the pants that I know. I will never get back into. And there are a whole section in the closet that just must go away because I can hold those up and they're just, I can blame the childbirth. Like I can blame anything that these pants are not going to get back on, but we must make room for the other clothes that we love and can wear every day, as opposed to the ones we have fond memories of. And this weekend we will be saying goodbye to some memories, you know? I mean, I'll be in my closet looking at those pants, walk right out of my closet and go make a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, shouldn't I be going and getting an apple? <laughs> but, you know, not going to happen. That's life. It's not going to happen. But on the subject of food, Margette is a, a, assessing Max's cooking and baking. And she's trying to measure it against hers, which she prides herself on. So mm-hmm. I love when she's in there and he has made, I forget what the dish was. And she's trying to figure out what is the ingredient that makes it better than hers. There's got to be something in there. And she's just standing there trying to figure it out. And like, what is this that makes him better at this than me? And I love that because if you're a real cook, you want to know, how did that turn out so good? That's really great stuff. So are you the real cook? You're the real cook? I'm the real cook. Um, It's fun to cook for Allie because the best thing that I think about being a cook is when people react well to it. I mean, it's the biggest compliment. If they get seconds, then you're just like, I'm, I'm over the moon. You know um, when have I ever just stopped at seconds? That's true. <laughs> She's really good for my ego. Um, you know, cooking was a love language growing up for me as a kid. Mm-hmm. It was a place where stories, the kitchen was where stories were mm-hmm. told. Mm-hmm. About all the women in my family, the things we went through, the, the hurdles we overcame as a family. Um, the ways we were trying to overcome the current hurdles. My grandmother, I stood at her elbow for hours at a time, just trying to learn her gumbo recipe because she didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oral storytelling is such a a pillar of the Black experience Mm -hmm. and it continues to be. And cooking is one of the ways that we continue those relationships. And um, you know, it was my chore since I was a kid. Uh, when I was 12, I was in charge of thawing out the meat, fixing the dinner, and my parents would come home because they were working people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a way that I love to gather people around. I know if I open my doors, people are going to smell my fried chicken and come knocking. <laughs> and there's it. a chair for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that cooking has that ability to bring people together. Mm-hmm. It's part of history. Tom's mom, a grandmother made this fabulous poppy seed cake. And when she passed away, I got the poppy seed cake pan. And I said to him, like, where's the recipe? And he goes, she told me it's on the back of the poppy seed can. <laughs> like, And we thought but it was- my so grandma funny. made that same one. <laughs> it was like- t- Yes. On the back of the, and I'm thinking there's some old world German recipe that's going <laughs> into this, blah, blah, blah. And she says- no, it's on the back of the can. And I it's was like, like a condensed milk can. Yes. Yeah. And I was just there like, I cannot believe this. It's like this poppy seeds in a can is like where I'm going to be learning how to make this thing. It was really funny. You know, but and, there's those and, family stories that you, you share on. And again, it's a human experience. Mm-hmm. We, something we have across every single culture on this planet is we got to eat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've got to eat. And as a species, I believe we're like the only one that shares, cooks and shares food. Mm -hmm. It means something to us. Mm -hmm. There is a reason that that is true. And my thought is that it's there to bring us together, Mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Like people come over the house and Corey, when he was growing up, my younger son, he had one friend that knew where he sat at the table. He knew where the placemats were and would put them out. And it was a really cool thing that everybody knew, like there was their place. This is what they were going to do. 
And I don't know. I, I, I love to cook. I love to entertain. I, we always make enough food like we're entertaining and then we just eat it ourselves, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's like fun. The other day I did, there's a lot of meat in the freezer and I decided that we had to do something about this. So I categorized it. And then I took the leg of lamb and marinated. I made a stew. I like did all this stuff. And I said, we have to empty the freezer. Like there's a lot of food there that we have to be eating. And it's like, it's become this humor around the house right now. Like next week is going to be pork week because we've gone through the beef, you know, it's, and I said to my husband, if you do one more thing where you take the, the, the beef later on and put in a little package, we now have 30 of those in the refrigerator. Like just make a meatloaf, just do something, you know? So how do you two work together? You always in the same room or in different places. What program do you use to share with each other? What do you do? Gosh. <laughs> program. I know <laughs> it's evolved too. And it, I think it's well, ever let's changing. Just, yeah. Let's just start though with we're like base. There's, there's no, yeah, there's no program. Well, there's no, it's like you share Word or Google Doc oh, she, or, no. Well, you know, she likes to write, use the computer and I still do a lot of longhand. Okay. Characters. I mean, I write sticky notes. We color code things. We make notes to each other. Um, I print out our book several times. Many trees um, have died. <laughs> we, we, yes. I turn it over sometimes. Um, we read aloud a lot. a lot because that character mm -hmm. voice is so important for Allie and me to mm -hmm. hear it. It's not enough to read it on the page. You know, we're talking about how we have Bonnie Turpin as our narrator for both books and she does such a phenomenal job, but it starts with us making mm -hmm. sure that these sound like people we know or could mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. that would, would a person use that word in a regular conversation? No, no, no. We got to find a new word. We want it to sound like real people. So we, I pace back and forth. Allie's madly typing away, telling me to slow down. Let's go back and read that again. Um, well, and specifically because Asha and I are writing from one voice. She's not writing the black characters and yeah. I'm writing yeah. the yeah. white characters. So we have to read it through together several times. So it just sounds like people and it just sounds like one person is writing it. There are a lot of, you know, great duos out there writing. And sometimes you can tell, you know, who's mm -hmm. the lawyer in the duo team and who's the English professor, who, you know, who's the what, but we... Our number one goal is for our readers never to assume that even one word mm -hmm. comes from Asha or one word comes from me, but they, we agree on every single word, every single punctuation, because we're writing about humanity, not about black people and mm -hmm. white people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, do you know where the story is going to evolve or like, oh, Carol, you must be joking. Like, or do you really no. know? We're like, is there an outline at the beginning or is there a seat of our pants? I, so I run a lot and that is my time. I really, I'm the 10,000 foot person. The joke is every book we write, there's always a word I can never spell. <laughs> and there's some punctuation I still haven't learned. And Asha, now you, she just like, doesn't even stop and poke fun at me. She's just like, fix it, fix it, fix it. But we don't outline. I really kind of see the whole story mm -hmm. and not just like, and then this is going to have this, but like, here's the beginning and here's the end. Now, how are we going to get there? Um, but our getting there is really all conversation. Mm -hmm. We talk all the time about life and then those conversations about life spin into where something's gonna go so we feel like I mean on uh because we have three full books written now that you know sometimes our work is very slow between the two of us because we have so much conversation we read out loud we have to agree on everything but our editing phase with our editors is short and fast because the book it. goes in really strongly, mm -hmm. you know, maybe three to four months of editing, maybe just 
two times through. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of heavy on the front end between the two of us, but it's lighter work on the editing side. I was going to guess that because if you put that much time in at the beginning, you know where the flow is going to go. You know where it's ebbing and flowing and tiding and whatever. If not, somebody's got to sit there and say to you, this is slow. This has got to be this. And sometimes it is that repetitive reading and it becomes the oral storytelling is so important mm -hmm. right now. As a tease authors that their rights for their audio used to be like rights to Finland. Like it didn't really matter, but <laughs> now your audio is huge because so many people are listening and, you know, right now, when you look at sales numbers, you look at print, E, and audio, and you have to combine the three of those to tell what your story is right now. And that never used to happen. It used to be, oh, it was an afterthought. There's some older books that there are no, there is no audio for because the rights for that were never even sold. So it's interesting to see how, yes, that reading of hearing the a words repetitive, or it just doesn't sound right. And I think that's the reason that you're the um the undertones of the book work so well because you take time to develop those and that's what makes them really super funny but i think you can tell i mean at least i can tell sometimes when you read books and dialogue and you're like you can tell the writer didn't read this out loud a lot because yeah. no one you know in their own house to their partner talks that formally or yeah. that stiffly mm -hmm. Um, stiffly a word yes, sounds, sounds good, good. okay good. <laughs> but you know that's where we really it gets tedious but we really know that that's our secret sauce is how much we read it out loud well she reads I type it together yeah yeah I'm not typing faster I'm typing faster she's 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 handwriting it's okay it's okay <laughs> so I love the recipes in the back of the book did you always know you're going to put those in I was really really looking for macaroni and cheese I gotta tell you I really want mac and cheese. She won't even give me the mac and cheese recipe. Oh, That's not happening. I promise I will make some for you when I see you, Carol. Okay. But there's some things that if you learn to make my mac and cheese or if Allie does, what am I good for then? You got I could be the East Coast version. You're the West Coast version. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's like rap. Yeah. East Coast, West Coast mac and cheese. Um, I'll make it for anybody that wants some, but I don't know if I can quite give it away yet. Maybe not some, yet, but, um, yeah. yeah, the, the recipes were a suggestion from our team, but we've, mm -hmm. well, we, I will say, so we made a little bit of mis well, two mistakes. So originally the book was called there are no calories in grief pie. I was going to ask you what the, that's what that was going to be one of my questions. Was this really yeah. the title all along? Yeah, yeah, no, it was for a long, long time. There are no calories in grief pie. And the grief pie was Margette's sweet potato pie. Um, so that stayed in there. And it was very much towards the end of the whole process mm -hmm. that the we had to um, change the title. They didn't want the word grief in it because it sounded too nonfiction, but all good reasons. And we love the title it is now. But a lot of people have said, well, why isn't it a Jewish recipe? Oh, interesting. Instead of the, you know, why didn't Allie put in a Jewish recipe? Which really, if we had had more time to really think, I probably should have put in my mom's Kugel recipe. <laughs> but because it had been grief pie for so long. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and supposedly it's my sweet potato pie recipe. And then I forgot to put in. And the copy editors, no one caught it including us, the amount of flour for the pie crust in the <laughs> recipe. And we had a reader email us. I'm like, oh my God, that is so embarrassing. Missing flour for a pie crust. <laughs> okay. My secret is I buy pie crust so I wouldn't notice. Yeah. I wouldn't notice that. <laughs> I don't make pie crust. I make a lot of things. The Trader Joe's makes a great pie crust and I yeah. just bring it home and it's like very good. That's funny. That's yeah, funny. Be very no, see, usually the recipes, they have to actually, somebody has to like cook them. Like, you know, somebody has to te taste test the recipes. When I was at um, Connie Nest, at Gourmet, the kitchen, they actually went and made everything many times. That'd probably be a good idea. Well, yeah. I did mine authentically because my, yeah. my grandmother, she never gave me one measurement ever, not one temperature, not any of it. It was experience, experience, experience. A little of this, a little of that. He says, stop sprinkling when the ancestors tell you to, mm. you know, and uh, it was a good metaphor for life too, because it taught me to keep trying things until I got them how I wanted them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I wrote my re the fried chicken recipe just like I was taught. Put a little of this, put a little of that. When you taste it, if you didn't like it, change it next time. Mm -hmm. And I wrote my recipe exactly like I cook, following the directions and missing a key ingredient. <laughs> Uh, I made bran muffins the other day and I look back at the recipe and it's my recipe. I looked down and go, forgot the oil. So my husband goes, these are really good. And the other day and I turn and I go, great, because I mixed, missed the oil in them. And I noticed they're a little drier. So I just poured more orange juice in. It's just right. like really, I just put some more orange juice, more about never noticed missing the oil. Never noticed. It was okay. It's a new way of, he thought it was great. It was fine. You have to underdo them. That's what it tells me. Underdo them. So do you talk to book groups? Do you, have you spent a lot of time talking to book groups about your books? Because yeah, that's we, all we did for Tiny Imperfections. Yeah, we had to pivot. I mean, yeah. who on this planet didn't have to learn Zoom? Yeah. <laughs> for someone as tech unsavvy as I am, it was a major pivot for me. Um, we also just love to contact and reach people face to face. So it was a difficult thing to accept, but we got used to it and we fell in love with it. It was great. We got to reach book clubs in Texas and on the East coast and ones just down the street. So we turned it into something positive, even though it started out as kind of like, uh, we, we get to talk to people on the screen. It was also an interesting time, not because of COVID, but because of the spring awakening to talk to book groups mm -hmm. and to be able to say to them, you can ask us anything. We are not going to judge. This is your place that you don't have to go to, you know, how to be an anti-racist. You don't have to go here or there. Just ask anything you want to ask. That's because so much is circulating in our world right now. So that was, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. We became a safe space for some people, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could see that. And I could see that they could have a really good conversation with you about the book. So can they reach you on your website and just say, we want to do a book club? I always say to people do that, but also tell them what time zone you live in. <laughs> it's like much better to do that. Also, I think zoom is a really good thing for having the book club. Um, Adriana Trigiani tells this one story about she was with a book club on speakerphone and they went out to the pool and they forgot that she was on the phone. And she's like, well, well, coming back anytime, yeah. coming back anytime soon. Right. <laughs> well, and we have to say that like, you know, cause you, you want it to be worth everyone's while. Like we like to have, you know, eight people is sort of, we've realized this kind of our magic number because enough interesting questions generate. And, minimum. minimum. Yeah, minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and an array of questions. Um, and it ends up not just us talking because enough people want to hear something as well. But yeah, on our website, um, under contact, just, just go there. there. And we're really good. Like uh, we always respond within 24 to 48 hours. That's you great. Know, some people you just get back the thank you very much standard email, but we always respond. No. And you know, it's, it's interesting because I think that eight is a good number. Eight, mm -hmm. we're in a book group right now. I think like a lot of times six will show up, but we also have the author come on after we've been talking for about 15 minutes so that you like handled, like I got bit by a stingray. One of the members of my group is watching. She's going to know exactly that story. <laughs> I, or I got, you know, like this is what happened with the kids. But we also, I have a group right now that I'm the oldest person in the group. Everybody else is in their forties. And we talk about how it's one of our favorite nights of the month of just sitting down and talking. And we've had authors, we're going to have an author live at the meeting next week that we're doing. And, but there are times we just sit down and talk. There are times where we let the last book, I won't share what the book was. We just didn't really think it was a good book to discuss. It was a fine book to have read. It's a book that a lot of people are talking about right now. So we went and did it, but we pivoted to its conversation about life pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And it was just fine. And it was not like, oh, we didn't do the right thing. Nobody cared. You know, it's yeah. next time it'll be a different book. You know, it'll be something else we can talk about. But I think that's such an awesome lesson to remind people mm -hmm. that like sometimes, you know, reading, going to movie, whatever, like it can just be for entertainment value. Yes. Not yes. everything, you know, someone, yeah, there's great stuff to discuss in our book for sure. But also people can just read it, laugh, have yeah. a moment of levity and move on too. And that's great as well. I'm um, you can open not, any page and laugh, folks. Any something. page and there's something to laugh at. Seriously, yeah. there really is. There really is. I am not joking. And the night that I woke up with a dream laughing, I said, this is okay. This book has really, really hit you know, like a good, a good spot with me. And it's like really funny because 
if I hadn't been at ALA and if I hadn't gone that day mm-hmm. and met you in that room, would I have known the first book and would I have looked forward to the second book? And there's moments that I just consider I was lucky that I was in the right place because we, you just gave up and gave that pitch that day. And I was like, just give me a book. Like, just like, just give me a book. <laughs> I think it was your mother's book or something. It was like, here, just take this one, you know? It's like, oh, it's like my mother's hair in it here. Let me spell that out. It was like, great. It was great. So you're working, you have another book done. You're completely finished with the next yep, one. We have a third book that comes out. You always said August, August 2023. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and we're about seven chapters into a fourth book. Wow. Now, yeah. do you have more confidence now going like with your editing team, with the partners that you've got at this point, or is it still like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Um, I think we feel good because we have we have a, a, a we have a terrific agent who's mm-hmm. always encouraging us. Mm-hmm. We have a really good team right now that we hope we get to work with for a long time. Allie and I go through our own personal ups and downs of, oh, is this good? I don't know. We really it still takes us a while to chug along and get into the story. Mm. We still have a hard time letting go of the characters that we write about because we fall in love with them and want to mm-hmm. be can maintain that relationship with them. I feel like I know um, them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, we go in ups and downs, ebbs and flows, but. Um, okay. She's using we here. This is where I'm going to differentiate. <laughs> no, I freak out at the beginning of every time. I can't do this. That just, that was like a weird blip in my life. What am I going to do does. for the next 30 years? Oh my God. Uh, yeah, no, I, every single one, I, re- I don't like these people. And she always says that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I freak out. And I got to tell her, give them a chance. It's going to be good. It's going to come together. Give yeah. A chance. I'm like, grow uh, on you. but writing's not easy. Writing's not easy. I mean, every week I write a newsletter and I sit there and I go, I, there's times on a Thursday night, I've got nothing. I've like really got nothing. I have no idea what I'm going to do here. And then there are other weeks, like the week I sat and wrote about this book, it's just psh, sit down and bang it out because it's exactly the way you feel. And I'm a champion of yours because you've made me laugh twice now. And that's like really good because there are not a lot of books that are really funny. They're not a lot. They're, some things try too hard or it's, it's not the right age of characters or something like that, but I feel like you guys are in this really great spot right now. And anything I could do to champion you, I'm going to be happy to do because it was really, it's fun. It's fun. I, the, the one piece I would put out there is that again, it's just the way, you know, publishing and storytelling has evolved is this idea that if it's funny, it must not be, as creative or it must not be art or it must not be someplace that I might learn. And um, humor is, you know, that it's easy. Humor is hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard and it's hard to do well. And we, you know, we want to champion, you know, curiosity and, and, you know, having um, a mix of friends around your table and all those good things. But we also really want to champion that, and you can help us, that humor is a way to learn and be exposed and grow mm-hmm. as much as drama mm-hmm. is. Completely I mean, is. Yeah. We, Completely is when you're sitting to our storytelling. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at what the show Will and Grace mm-hmm. did for, you know, gay rights, marriage, just, you know, being a part of the world and showing like, hey, we're just like everyone else. I mean, it was unbelievable and it was all done through humor Mm -hmm. it was a beautiful you know 10 seasons that I think changed the trajectory in our country more than you know a lot of the really gripping difficult tales of Mm -hmm. being gay in America and like god love that show I love blackish I really thought blackish was absolutely I, I love the one where they were going away on Martin Luther King weekend. And was that the right thing? <laughs> They're to going doing? skiing. And it's yeah. like, we're going skiing and we can't tell people because that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And that show, I felt like had that same kind of honesty that you've got into your writing. If there's a vibe that's the same, it's like, I'm. they turn to him in the room as you're the black person in the room. Tell us what you think we should do on this campaign. And it's not, you're a person, you're the black person in the room. And I think that 
we've got to get over those kinds of lines and equations. It's just somebody who's being able to tell a good story or just being able to pipe up their opinion. But I thought that there were so many moments of that show that were just really funny. The kid who's not really basically getting through school, the twins, like the whole thing was just your typical family to me. It was funny, you know? And I also learned a lot watching that show though. I learned a lot. And it was like the, the Martin Luther King episode was extremely funny. You know, is there are these things now you're supposed to be doing like now it's not Columbus Day. It's this. I say, you know, what? we're off Monday. I don't care what you're calling it. We're not working. Whatever it is. We're not going. <laughs> it's too long a time between Labor Day and Thanksgiving. We take whatever that day is off. You know, <laughs> personally, wish that Martin Luther King was born in like July. It's a little bit hard to come back in January and have that, you know, two weeks and then we're off again. <laughs> right. The fall start. Different. Yeah. Juneteenth, my son really wishes did not fall out against Father's Day so many weekends because it'd be a great time to go away. I mean, let's get real. What are holidays really about? It's about you're going to go do something. You're going to go someplace or whatever. And I remember one time I got in big trouble at the, um, what you call it, in the newsletter. So one of the few times I've really been called out, I think one of the, the only time I've been called out by a reader, because I said something about Martin Luther King Day. We've seen family. So now it's time for skiing and shopping. And oh boy. I got a reading list. I got called out. I was in big trouble, big trouble. And I've never done that again. Never done I that. Think every holiday should just be like back to back to back. And so everyone gets two weeks off. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> just like stack them up. And then you can kind of do, you can go away. You could do some community service. You can sleep in, you can celebrate, <laughs> but everyone gets this chunk of time. Real cultural practitioners here. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it, you know, it was really funny because there's this one school in um, New Jersey, there's a school in Clifton, and they're voting whether they're not going to do any of the holidays, because if they do all the holidays for the Indian children, the Jewish children, if they do every single holiday that's going to go on, school will not end to the end of June, because yeah. there'll be two extra weeks of holidays of what to do and what to do about it. It was a really interesting news story the other day, because as towns are changing and becoming more culturally diverse, there's a moment that you have to sit there and say, what am I going to do? Because Diwali is just as important to somebody else as Martin Luther King Day is, as, you know, Christmas is. It's just important to think about. So, guys, it's been great. I love talking to you. so much. It really enjoy this. We've got to do this. We got to do just get on a phone and just chat. We got to get on Zoom and just chat more often. You know what I mean? We'll Make come me laugh. see it, too. Yeah. We <laughs> promise our next book, you will laugh. It's, just, it's so fun. Well, let's oh say, even if we're not in the city anymore, you can just come to my house and I'll watch okay. you make macaroni and cheese. I'll watch what you're doing yeah. and we'll go from there, you know? Do it. Yeah. I'm there. We're Everybody, there. these books are a delight. Both of them. Both of them. I mean, seriously, this and this. If you read both, I promise you're going to smile. I promise you're going to think and you're not going to get beaten over the head. You're just going to have a really good time. So to both of you, thank you for joining us. Really been fun. Thank and to you. everybody else, we look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks. To remember, you can subscribe on YouTube. They always tell me I have to say these things. Mm -hmm. Either that or if you listen to podcasts, where wherever you listen to podcasts, you can subscribe and make sure you never miss an episode. Because I don't think you want to do that. So thanks everyone for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>